we've got some things here we're working through as I continue on. I guess I'm the one that uh, realized now it's my turn. So glad to see all of you. Again, I think this is a great way. They've given us the opportunity to fellowship, even though we can't actually be together. I'm looking forward to the fact we're going to be able to hug one another and shake one another's hands one of these days, and it won't be too long from now. We just got to keep that in mind and remember, continue to memorize and think about that and realize that this too will pass. You know, the reality is, as you look at life itself, it's, it's the reality that life is always changing. Things happen that we don't always like. And it's at that point in time that we've got to come to the realization that, and I think this is the reason why God allows us to go through that so that we'd realize that we're not in charge. And that's whenever we hold on to our hope the very most the hope of Christ, the hope of eternal life, the hope of, of being with God forevermore in heaven, the hope of no more sin, no more heartache, no more pain, no more suffering, no more of the junk that we have to put up with here in this life. I was studying this idea of hope this last week and preparation for this, come across a sermon. It's not totally 100% mine, but the bottom line is, is I've added my part to it. So I hope and pray that maybe I can give you something to think about as we think about this idea of hope. A fellow by the name of Thomas Brooks said a Christian will part with anything rather than his hope. That Because that hope is what keeps the heart from aching and breaking and fainting and sinking. He knows that hope is a beam of God, a spark of glory, and that nothing shall extinguish it until the soul be filled with glory. And that's what we're looking for. And I think all of us, especially when we go through times like these, we look a little bit more forward to heaven. Think about the idea that when we get there, we're not going to have to use Zoom or anything else to be around one another. We're going to be all together, praising God forevermore throughout eternity. And so we understand that that's the, what we're living for. That's what we hope for. That's what we dream for. That's the reason why even at funerals, even at the side of a grave, we know that there's something a whole lot better. And we look forward to it. And hopefully, again, as we go through these situations in our lives, it'll always remind us there's something always better to look forward to. When you start thinking about this, there's a lot of different books in the Bible that talk about hope, but today we're going to look mainly from Romans. And the first three things I'm going to talk about is mainly going to be from chapter 2 through chapter 5. We're not going to have a whole lot of area to go through, so if you want to turn in your Bibles there, and again, now that we're on all this other stuff, you can probably, I've got my sermon and my computer and I also have my Bible in front of me. So the bottom line is you might be able to keep up with me a little bit better and everything like that. Romans chapter one, Paul condemns the Gentile world. And in essence says that everybody in the Gentile world is sinners because number one, they've not had the access to God's law and even tried to live it. And they whenever they don't have and are trying to live by God's law, as a result, they live their lives any way they want to. To me, that describes the world today. Secondly, in chapter two, he emphasizes the idea that the Jews are under condemnation as well, because even though they condemned the Gentiles, they themselves were doing the very same thing. And he emphasizes the idea in chapter three, verse 10, verse 23, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think his way of doing that is emphasizing the idea that we all need a savior. The Old Testament law and law keeping couldn't keep, couldn't cause us to be saved because we couldn't be good enough by ourselves. But then he also brings out the idea that God knew that we needed a savior. He gave us the Old Testament law to show us that we couldn't do it by ourselves. And he also emphasized to us that we need a savior. So as he starts looking at that, he then starts talking about the ideal of faith in Romans chapter four. And this is where we're going to pick up. He starts off by talking about Abraham's faith. And he will quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse six, where he emphasized that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him. And that word accounted is a word that suggests the idea that in, the, in, a, in a ledger, you've got debits and you've got credits. And so he said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted. It was credited to him for righteousness. It was not because Abraham was perfect. We know that he wasn't. It was because he believed that God was going to take care of the problem of sin. And so he continued to allow that belief to cause him to do that. And so in Romans, the fourth chapter, as he goes on, talks about Romans or 
as he talks about Paul's faith, he stressed this idea. Look at this. Beginning really actually in verse 16, he says, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He says, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom we believe, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things who, contrary to hope, believed in hope, <clears throat> so that he might become the father of many nations. Now, this is the first thing I want you to key in on. Think about this for just a minute. This is kind of a paradoxical statement. Now, what is a paradoxical statement? Again, I wanted to understand that, so I looked it up in the dictionary, and, and it's a, se a paradox is a seeming contradiction. It's the idea that it seems absurd or self-contradictory. It seems like that that's absurd. Who against hope believed in hope? That's just kind of like a scratches our head. And here's what he's trying to say. He says he believed in the hope that God gave him and that what caused him to live the life by faith that he did. Now think about this. Hope is more than just wishful thinking. If my hope is only about the resurrection is only hoping that it's going to happen one of these days, that's not really hope. Faith causes me to believe enough to where I eagerly anticipate it, and I expect God to keep his word in giving me that. God is going to keep his word. And so when we think about that in a moment, we have to realize that even though the outward circumstances of my life doesn't seem like it's going to work out at that moment in time, God is going to keep his word, which is going to show us in uncertain terms, it's going to work out, number one, the way he wants it, and number two, it's going to work out for our benefit because of God's passionate, abiding love for us each and every day of our lives. When we look through the eyes of faith and keep our faith in God, not in ourselves, then we can hope and know, and that's where that key is, when because of our hope, we can know that we have eternal life, we can know that we're forgiven of sins, and we believe that because God is a God that does not break his word. So he emphasizes the idea of what? Against hope, I mean, looking at it from a worldly viewpoint, he could not see how God was going to do everything he promised in making of him a great nation, a great name, giving him a great land. It was going to be 430 years later before these things actually took place, but he kept on believing because he trusted God's promise. Paul will talk about the fact in 1 Corinthians 13, there are about a faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. But you see, I have to have faith in God's love to trust him enough to do his set words. I have to hope enough in him that even though when our circumstances seem bleak and there's no way it's going to be fulfilled in my lifetime, God's still going to do what he says. So you see, there is that paradox and that's it. And I, the question I want to challenge each and every one of us, do we continue to believe in God and have enough faith that we're going to continue to believe in the hope of something that we have a little bit later on that's even going to be grander than what we go through and what we have to deal with right now. And that's what hope is. And secondly, you think about the idea, he goes on in this particular passage, after talking about that idea of hope earlier in chapter 4, verse 18, he said in verse 19 of chapter 4, he said, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced, that's what faith is, that's what faith that motivates that hope, being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able also to perform, therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what does Paul say in Romans 4? He said, it wasn't written to, for his sake alone, but for us also. When we have the faith of Abraham and believe God, it works out in that same respect. And the fact is that he raised up Jesus from the dead. And 
delivered him up for our offenses, was raised for our justification. So my faith is not in me. And my I'm trying to keep law, God's laws. My faith is in Christ. My faith is in what he did. My faith is in his blood to forgive me of my sins. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Secondly, first off, realize the idea that there is a paradox in grace. It seems like it's it's a contradiction, but it's not, not when we bring faith in. Secondly, realize we have joy in our hope. Now think about this. We have peace with God. It's, we don't have to fear God. God has taken care of our sin problem. God has dealt with everything that we're going on. And, and again, we have this peace with God. It's not just a peace of mind, but knowing because God said it, and again, this is where it comes back to. I really want you to think about this. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. So when we believe God, when he says he forgives us of our sins, we should let him go. We should let it go ahead and go and understand that he's there. And so we then realize that we stand in that grace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And this word rejoice here is different from a lot of other words that we read about this translated rejoice. This particular Greek word in, in, in this suggest is translated glory 23 times, but it's also translated boast and rejoice. So he, he, Paul is saying here, he said, we boast in the glory of God. We rejoice in it because we know that we will have it. We boast in it because in essence, we're bragging to folks, look, we know that there's something a lot better than this. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that this isn't the only time we need to be saying this. We don't need to be saying it just at the time when somebody passes away and we're standing at somebody's graveside. We need to be rejoicing and boasting in the hope that we have of the glory of God constantly. And so as we think about this, we put our hope in someone besides ourselves, that's God. We have faith in him enough to obey his words and keep his commandments. We believe in his word when he say that whenever we sin, he will forgive us of our sins. If I confess that sin and repent of that sin, and then what? I can boast in God's glory and the fact that one day I'm going to share in that glory. And again, I want you to remind you of this. There will be no coronavirus there. There will be no threat of flu and all this other stuff that may take us out here. The bottom line is we have hope in the glory of God. Now, we go on a little bit further in this passage. And again, he emphasizes the idea in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 5. He says, we rejoice, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, produce, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Three things here to look at in this last point I'm trying to bring out. Hope produces some things. Number one, it emphasizes the idea that when we glory in the tribulations that we have to go through, when we take comfort in them, when we, like the Apostle Paul, rejoice that we're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, then that tribulation, the trials that we go through, produces perseverance, and that perseverance produces character, and that character produces the hope. Hope's function is to motivate, to hopefully help us to have the right conduct, to endure whatever we're going through, and allow it to build the character that we need to be building. You know, sometimes we sit around and moan and woe about what's going on in our lives. Um, we, we struggle with so many different things, sickness, uh, losing loved ones, concern, uh, am I going to have enough food? Do we have enough stocked up for the next few weeks? Whatever it's going to take as we get through this situation. Our normal is no longer normal. Now we have what we might say the new normal for probably another couple of months, it sounds like. 
So what do you do? You don't give up hope. You go through this, smile on your face, joy in your heart, knowing we've got something better. You do what you can to help those that you can. And that suggests the idea that, you know, we're going to try to continue to help those that are older. We're going to try to continue to help those that are there. And that's why I've stressed all along. We need to call them. Zoom is giving us the opportunity to see one another. So that brings cheer to our hearts. And we realize as we go through all of this, yes, it's not like we're meeting at 1776 Clay Road, but we are one at the same time. We're still a family. We're still sharing with one another. We're still rejoicing in what we have together as Christians. And I think that this is just a, a, a prediction of what we're going to have eternally in heaven. And that's what we look forward to. So you see, as we go through these struggles, as we go through these trials, as we go through these afflictions, some of these things may cause some people to be separated from the love of Christ. It should cause all of us to have greater faith, greater hope, and know that this isn't always the end of the story. I challenge you to think about the ideal as well, and that that brings about that endurance. That's producing character. That perseverance tests us, is producing the character, and the whole ultimate goal is hope. And what does he say? Hope does not disappoint. It does not put us to shame. Listen to what he says in Proverbs 22, or Psalms 22. He says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. They say he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And we remember that this Psalm is talking about what they were saying at the cross when Jesus died. But you see, Jesus, against what he saw right there in front of him, the pain, the difficulty that he was going through at the cross, he still knew that he was going to go back and be with his father. And that's what he wanted more than anything else. And you see, brothers and sisters, that's what we must do as well. Hope does not disappoint. It does not bring us to shame. It gives us the things that we need to go through in this life. And again, it challenges us. It's not an illusion. It's based on our faith in God. It's based upon God's love for us. Human hope sometimes deceives, but God never will. And that's something we need to think about all the time. There's no way we can know this side of eternity. There's no way that we're going to know. And again, I, I, I don't know how it's going to be like in heaven, but there's no way that we can know this side of eternity, God's love for us, how deep, how wide, how long. We can't even begin to grasp it, but we believe it. And you see, that's what we've got to do. Keep the faith, keep the hope, and make sure that we're trusting in God. So I, I'm closing as it was, a very quick lesson as it was, but thinking about the success situation, how is your hope? Think about that for a moment. What is your hope in? Is it in your job? Well, some of, I don't know of anybody right now at South Cobb, but the bottom line is some folks are, are sweating it because right now I think we've got 6 million people out of work right there. 6 million people in this country right now out of work. So, you know, well, okay, the government's going to save us. Um, no, they're not going to save us either. You know what I'm trying to say? Maybe we, we trust our fellow man, and you know, that's what it boils down to. Maybe we trust our education. Maybe we could try against all of these things, but the thing is, we've not seen Jesus. We've not seen God in the flesh. We've not seen how God works, though, and a lot of times we have seen how he works things out for us after this all said and done, right? We have to keep the faith, and we, against hope, as Abraham did, against hope, we believe in hope, we trust in God's grace, and we allow that hope to cause us to persevere through the problems, through the trials, through the tribulations. We 
rejoice in that hope and continue to believe in that hope and the fact that it will one day find its full culmination when we're living with God forevermore in heaven. But until then, it produces hopefully the faith that will keep us trusting God no matter what. One of the things that we have noticed over the last few weeks as we've been trying to do this together is in worship together is the idea that we were not offering an invitation, but uh, let me say this to you and, and challenge you to think about it in this respect. I want you to look at your life, your relationship with God. How is your faith doing right now? Are you still trying to stand firm? Do you continue to study God's word? Do you continue to study and pray? Do you pray to God about all that's going on in America right now? Have you prayed to God specifically about uh, our older members? Have you prayed to God about those that are, that are in, on the front lines, the doctors and the nurses? And again, we've got so many of them that are serving right now. And I, I'm just so grateful for that. I think about, and I've said this before, the police officers that, that are responding to that, to the fire department. Think about those EMT personnel. Do you pray for them? Brothers and sisters, we, it's not something we just need to talk about. It's something we need to do. Faith in God is going to cause us to pray about these things. Faith in God is going to cause us as much as we can and, and still continue to obey the laws of the land, try to continue to help out those folks that are in need right now. We can call all these folks. But we also have to think about the fact that maybe right now, some of us may be having a weak faith and maybe right now we need some extra prayers. Um, share that with the elders, share that with those that you can trust. Let us know that, that you're struggling right now. And this again comes back down to the ideal of what an invitation is for is for the purpose of, you know, if you're really struggling right now with your faith, you're really struggling right now with, with worry and doubt, then here's the opportunity for us to help you in praying for you. And if you wanna do that privately with us, give us the opportunity, let us help you. Um, let us do what we can to help you in, in building your faith right now at this time. If you maybe have another brother or sister that you trust in that much more and you, you can provide him, contact them. Because the last thing we need to be doing now is giving up our faith in Christ the last thing we need to be doing up right now is giving up our faith in one another. The last thing we need to do right now is give up the hope and that eternal blessing that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I hope and pray that all of us will get involved and do what we can to build one another up during these times. I think doing this by Zoom, some folks aren't able to do it right now, but hasn't it been wonderful just to be able to see one another's face? Hasn't it been able, isn't it wonderful just to know that there's others right now that, that are kind of like we are in the house and we're what? Lord, when is this ever going to end? <laughs> you know, hey, it's going to. And just we just need to continue to put, put our faith and trust in God. Let us help you. Call us. Help, let us help you in every way that we possibly can. Because again, brothers and sisters, that's what it's all about. Let me also suggest to you again, uh, there have been some emails going out and I just kind of want to remind you about this, but if you've not had the opportunity to give, you can send that straight to Rob. You can send it to the church building. Uh, we do go by and check the mail and make sure that that's taken care of. Uh, because like I said before, the bills have still got to be paid. So keep on thinking about that. Any other way that we can be of service to you, because this is really what it's all about. Let us do it. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for helping us and working with us and through us and help us to, to be all that we need to be for the Lord.